Starlink on the go just got even better, Convergent Orbit survive, Axiom a go for another Dragon mission and much more is coming up in tomorrow's Space News. The orbital flight test is now just over the horizon and the final preparations are in full swing. For example, the finishing touches with Ship 24's heat shield have now been installed. The shielding panels around the top of the OLM are finally all fully installed, protecting the plumbing that surrounds the business end of the world's most powerful rocket. The piling drill we saw at the production site last week has also swung into action, potentially laying the foundations for a third high bay. All of this work has not brought the launch date any closer though, and understandably it's no longer predicted for March. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has said on Twitter that a more realistic time frame, at least at the moment, is a launch attempt in the second half of April. SpaceX's ever-expanding Starlink constellation has expanded once again with yet another service available to humans back on Earth. It's called Rome, which, if it wasn't already obvious, allows you to roam around Earth and use Starlink whilst in motion. This may seem very similar to Starlink for RVs, and from what I can gather, it is. They've just given the service its own category and taken some new photos for the website. Compared to its conventional, non-moving residential sibling, Starlink Rome is about 26% more expensive per month with the same equipment cost. Keep in mind, however, that these prices are taken from the UK service, so the exact percentage changes could vary in your region. Axiom 3 has been approved by NASA and is currently all clear for a November flight to the International Space Station, depending on more vital traffic to and from the station, such as how NASA crew and cargo Dragon, Starliner and Cygnus operations are going at the time. Axiom 3, which is officially abbreviated as AX3, is currently planning to be a 14-day mission, four days longer than the upcoming AX2, scheduled for launch in May. The crew is yet to be announced, however the CEO of Axiom, Michael Suffredini, has said that AX3 and AX4 are more likely to have countries as customers than private citizens, although private citizens were not ruled out. The current cap for Axion missions to the ISS is two per year, which is a cap set by NASA just because of the number of ports and the number of spacecraft that are required to visit for government and crew and cargo purposes. Axiom is getting their own modules over the coming years though, and with their own docking ports it'll increase capacity, opening these kinds of flights to more and more people every year. Alongside their launch approval, Axiom Space have unveiled their new lunar spacesuit, named the AX-EMU, which stands for Axiom Extravehicular Mobility Unit. It's taken technology from NASA's X-EMU design, which itself was unveiled by Jim Bridenstine back in 2019. Now don't get your hopes up, because the black, orange and blue design is not going to fly to the moon. Instead, just like with the Apollo suits, the suit will be white in colour to help with the thermal management. White reflects light, and on a body with no atmosphere, all of that light from the sun will be going straight onto the suit. Axiom said that the reason they were covering the suit in this Earth-only design is because the technology behind the suit is proprietary, even though it's based off NASA's XEMU. Those of you who are fans of Apple TV Plus's For All Mankind series might be interested to find out that this design was actually designed by the show's costume designer, Esther Marquis. This suit is, of course, just a prototype suit for the demonstration. Axion will be delivering a full fleet of training suits to NASA by the end of the summer, which will allow the Artemis crew to get used to the latest generation of lunar spacesuit hardware. Virgin Orbit, the small satellite launch company that wants to bring launch services to places where traditionally you just can't launch rockets, has unfortunately been facing financial difficulty for some time. Last week, they announced a seven-day shutdown of the company, following nearly all staff unpaid, keeping just a small team on board to keep the company running. According to CNBC, leaders at Virgin Orbit told employees to expect an update on the furlough situation this Wednesday or Thursday. Virgin Orbit then later gave a public statement to CNBC saying that an update will be on the way in the coming weeks. To get money flowing through the company, they need to be launching stuff, and they can't be launching stuff without a concluded investigation into the failure that struck the Start Me Up mission in January. If the company can find the money to launch again, then the investigation is on their side, as it is nearly concluded and the next Launcher 1 vehicle that has the modifications to prevent the failure from happening again is in the final stages of integration testing. Parent company The Virgin Group has pumped 55 million US dollars into Virgin Orbit since November over three separate convertible notes, one unsecured and two secured. 
They've yet to announce when the 2022 quarter four earnings will be published and they're currently sitting at 65 cents per share. Unsurprisingly, being one of the launch providers gunning for the first successful orbital launch from UK soil, I really want Virgin Orbit to succeed and return to launching their customers' payloads. I truly believe that if the company can get some help getting into first gear, then the money will start flowing. The launch cadence last year was lower than expected because Cosmic Girl and the launch team were stuck in Cornwall awaiting the CAA to sort out the launch license. The launch cadence this year is also lower because they've been waiting for the investigation to conclude in to start me up. Things haven't really been going Virgin Orbit's way over the last few months and I really want the company to hold through this tough financial period and come out the other side in a much stronger position. And just before we get into all of the launches from the past week, Rocket Lab have released this graphic hyping up the recovery of the first stage in their upcoming flight from LC1. Rocket Lab are yet to successfully catch a first stage with all of the recovery attempts ending with electrons splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. It seems as if this could be all that's needed for recovery of such a small booster because the historically anti-marine assets CEO Peter Beck is now relying on them. Another week, another flight of SpaceX's Dragon, but just before we get into CRS27, thank you to our YouTube members, the citizens of tomorrow. Without their financial support, the cost of operating station 204 would be even higher than it is already. If you want to help pay for 204, see Space News scripts as they're being written and hang out in our member-only post shows, head to the join button below for just 99 cents per month. Supporting monetarily is not an expectation, it's just a nice add-on if you feel like it. Just sharing our content around goes a long way in making tomorrow look a lot more appealing to the algorithm. Commercial Resupply Services 27 launched at half past midnight coordinated universal time on Wednesday the 15th of March from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The capsule being taken to the skies was C209 making it its third flight to the orbiting laboratory which it last visited in 2021. Inside of Cargo Dragon are many tons of payloads such as NASA's Elena 50 CubeSats, ArcSat-1 and LightCube which are from the University of Arkansas and Arizona State University respectively. The booster supporting this mission, B-1073, was a bit more experienced than the Dragon it was carrying, touching down for the seventh time in its career onto the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. Sneaking in between the launch and docking of CRS-27 was Cheyenne 19, a Chinese Earth observation satellite. The payload was launched on this Long March 11 to a sun-synchronous orbit at 11.41 Universal on Wednesday from Site-95 at the Xiquan Satellite Launch Center. Dragon C-209 continued up to the ISS and following a 35-hour cruise, it docked to the forward port on the Harmony module at 11.31 UTC on Thursday. Also on Thursday was a launch from Rocket Lab, stronger together at 22.38 UTC from Launchpad 0C, branded as LC-2 at the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. On board Electron were two 100 kilo satellites for Capella Space, Capella 9 and Capella 10. Following a kick from the Curie engine on the Photon kick stage, they were successfully delivered into their intended 600km, 44-degree low Earth orbit. We're heading back to China as they've begun to pick up the pace with their launch cadence. Gaofen 1302 launched on this Long March 3BE at 0833 UTC on Friday the 17th of March from Launch Complex 2 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. This is the second mission of Gaofen 13, a geostationary observation constellation. Unsurprisingly then, the rocket delivered the payload into a geotransfer orbit. Of course, there was a Starlink launch this week, specifically being Group 2 Mission 8. This flight commenced at 1926 UTC from Slick 4 East at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. 52 V1.5 satellites were delivered to a 70 degree initial orbit, where they'll be raising themselves up to 540 kilometers over the coming weeks. The booster supporting this flight, B1071, concluded its eighth flight by touching down on Of Course I Still Love You, which was positioned just off the coast of Baja, California. And just over four hours later, SpaceX were launching yet again, marking a new world record for the shortest gap between two orbital launches by the same organization. It wasn't a Starlink, but it was two communication satellites, SES-18 and SES-19, which were from, you guessed it, SES. These two satellites were the final of four launched on behalf of SES in the Great Seabound Replacement. 
The Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, announced that certain frequencies used by satellites are going to be blocked off and used for ground-based 5G services instead. Because of this, many communications satellite operators have now been racing to get new satellites into space that avoid these frequencies, with the deadline being the 5th of December 2023. The upcoming departures from Earth with an orbital velocity or greater over the next seven days are the Beat Goes On Electron, previously mentioned from LC-1B on the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, Terran 1's Good Luck Have Fun, the maiden flight for relativity, that's currently scheduled for Thursday from Slick 16 at the Cape, there's a boosterless Soyuz 2.1V with EO MKA-4 from Site 434 at Plzetsk. There's then Starlink Group 5 Mission 5 on a Falcon 9 from Slick 40 on Friday and one web number 18 on a GSLV Mark III on Sunday. The week's just starting, which means it's plenty of tomorrow coming to you over the next seven days. On Wednesday, Dr. Tamitha Scove will be back with another space weather update, including the latest developments from our sun's atmosphere. On Friday, we'll be returning with our weekly live show and next Monday, you know it, I'll be back with another week's worth of news. But for now, thank you for watching. And goodbye.